there are activity bags. If your children need them, go get them. And um, if you would, I'd like you to turn to uh, Matthew chapter 4. We're going to be looking at the temptation of Christ. We'll look at Matthew 4, verses uh, 1 through 11. Follow along as I read. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, you will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and the angels came and attended him. Um, read many commentaries, but one commentary I'm reading is uh, pastoral, and I'm sure that he had first preached through the book, and then wrote the commentary in this one series that I have. Anyway, while he was in high school, um, uh, he did not like math, and math did not like him. And so what he did is he pretty much cheated his way through math. (laughs) In one particular class, he was stumped. Uh, It was a little more uh, advanced class in algebra, and um, there was a star student in the class, and it seemed that, you know, at first when he was teaching his, or cheating his, his conscience would bug him, but he finally, you know, seared his conscience, and he began to care less, and the star student who was helping him through class was um, uh, caring less, and he kind of felt the teacher probably didn't care either. He knew what was going on, and so he passed algebra. About a year later, he became a Christian, and he said that he would never cheat again. Uh, He left the college that he was attending and decided to go to Wheaton College there in uh, Illinois, and um, become a Bible and uh, theology uh, student, uh, which you have to take Greek. And he said, you know, I'm in the second semester of Greek, and I'm realizing that the math guys are the guys who get Greek. And he said, and I wasn't a math guy, and I wasn't doing very well in Greek. I noticed the same thing. I had so much trouble figuring out, because a Greek sentence is like a, uh, a cent- or an equation. So these math guys, they would just sit down there and put the equation together and translate like nothing. So I thought, well, that's good because we had made the same observation. That's totally free. It's totally off the subject, okay? And anyway, uh, he got sick for the final uh, second semester and was not able to take the exam on time. And his professor very graciously said, look, I'll leave the exam outside my office. There's a mailbox there. You can pick up the exam uh, when you're well. And... um, uh, and, re- and return it. So he did. And uh, he also found, though, a, an exam that was finished in the mailbox uh, by a star student in the Greek class. So what was he tempted to do? Yeah, not only take his test, but the star student's test. And he did. He did. And he went o- over to the library, and he sat down to take the test, or copy the test, and his conscience got to him. And he said, I just can't do this. So he returned the finished test, went back, took the test by himself, and he passed. Okay? Temptation. What's the essence of temptation? Well, as we will see in number three, it is the desire to do something that is independent of God's will. In other words, it's wanting something badly, but going outside God's will to get it. That's it in a nutshell or what God wants for us at that time, or what his word has said. And often what we are tempted to do may not be something evil as we consider evil, though that can be the case, but something that is otherwise good. 
Money is not bad. It's a good thing. But to acquire it in questionable ways is. To acquire something for ourselves, to go out and buy something, is not wrong. But the timing and the expense at the time may make it wrong. To be married is not wrong, but to marry outside God's guidelines is. So here's the thing. What if this pastor at Wheaton had not put the test back? Well, his conscience would have eaten at him, and it would have probably left an indelible mark, you know? This lifelong memory when every time he thinks about it, how'd you get through school? Well, I cheated my way through school. Memories now can serve for the good, you know, I mean, they do bring the guilt, you know, back to the present. But, you know, they can teach us to never do it again. God can use that for the good. And it may also cause us to rely on God's grace. You know, we've all sinned, and uh, uh, we have our memories that bother us. And when this happens, and I've said this many times, and I'll say it many times more, that we claim our justification and our forgiveness, and we do so with thanksgiving. It's how we learn grace. But if we continue to give in to temptation, we will not know the freedom that we are to have in Christ. What is freedom in Christ? First, it's the freedom from the reign of sin and death, the reign of the devil. But it's also a freedom of conscience. We are to know a freedom of conscience as we live day to day with God. And to experience this freedom of conscience, we need to fight temptation just as Jesus did. After Jesus was baptized, he went into the wilderness to fast. He had water, but no food. And he also went out to meet the devil. It was deliberate on God's part. And as we saw last week, the first thing that confirmed or validated Jesus' ministry was this baptism. The second thing that validated his ministry was his victory over the devil. Now we've got to keep in mind that Jesus was as much man as he was God. We really like to emphasize the God part, right? And I probably do too. Uh, but he was equally uh, a man. And so he felt the full weight of Satan's temptations. Uh, they were great. And so Jesus relied upon God, the Holy Spirit, to help. Remember at his baptism? The Spirit alighted upon him. And so as the Son of God and as a man, he would lean upon God's strength for him with, by the help of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, Jesus not only validates his ministry and proves himself to be the perfect man for the perfect sacrifice, and we could just stop there, but as our Savior, he also serves as an example for you and me when we face our temptations. And as he found victory, we at least in part can also find victory. So here are some principles, and I came up with more and I tried to condense these things into, you know, one or whatever, uh, or two, um, and I've left some things out. But anyway, five principles for when we are tempted. First one is this, that temptation can be an or God-ordained test. You go, what? Temptation can be a God-ordained test. And the Greek word uh, for temptation can also mean to test. So in God's economy, a temptation from the devil can be God's test to strengthen us, to build fortitude into our lives. God, by the Holy Spirit, led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. So as one guy I read put it, temptation can be God-ordained, but it is not God-inflicted. The word by is used twice, that Jesus was led by the Spirit, but he was tempted by the devil. God does not tempt us, nor can he, but he certainly allows for us to be tempted. It is the devil that does the tempting. Illustration, Job. God gave Satan so much reign over Job's life, he was tested, okay? And through the fight, we then grow. Who feels the weight of temptation more? The person who gives in or the person who fights it? The latter. Now, the person who gives in will suffer the results of sin, but they don't feel the battle like the person who fights. 
So God ordains for us to be tempted by the devil to test us. He grows us up and he strengthens us. The one who fights temptation is the one who grows. Temptation is going to happen no matter what. So look at it this way, as God's test. And with it, he will give us the strength to bear it. Principle number two. Temptation often strikes when we are, are weak and alone. It was after Jesus had fasted 40 days that the devil appeared. Jesus was alone, and he was also in a weakened state. And therefore, as a man, he felt the full toll of the devil's uh, enticements. From this, let's bear a couple things in mind. Uh, first of all, because Jesus was tempted, he knows what you and I are going through when we are tempted. We are told in Hebrews we have a sympathetic high priest, and we're always able to go before the throne of grace and lay our prayers out there, our prayers of help, help me. And we know that we have a high priest there who knows what we are going through. He didn't give in, but he still knows what temptation is all about. And secondly, because temptation was not sin for Jesus, temptation is not sin for us. Some people confuse the two. They think just because they're being tempted, that in itself is sin. Temptation is not sin. It's giving in, that is. Now, I know that you and I go through mind games and we, you know, we, we deal with all kinds of internal sins and so forth. Like That's different. I'm saying when we are tempted, that in itself is not the sin. Sin enters when we uh, give in. So remember that, because I think sometimes we can beat ourselves up uh, uh, when we shouldn't. Have you ever noticed, like Jesus, that it is when we are alone and idle that our minds go places that they shouldn't? You ever notice that? That the fight seems to be greater. So we need to fellowship with other Christians. We can't go it alone. And when temptation strikes, this sounds very unspiritual and very practical, get busy. Go do something. <laughs> Don't just sit there, okay? I'm serious. You know, people say, well, you better go pray. Well, yeah, but you better not sit there and pray forever. You know, just get up and go do something. Uh, idleness, you know the old saying, is the devil's workshop. And some of us sometimes have too much time on our hands. Mondays can be like this for me, especially during the school year when Alice works. She leaves. And I am alone. It's my day off. Um, it's different in the summer. It's great. She's there, and we can talk and so forth. But during the school year, it's different. And Monday's a low day. You know, you've got, you're going through this adrenaline uh, crash, you know, and I can have my quiet time, my coffee and granola, and then guess what? I better go get busy. <laughs> I better go get busy and do something. Are we to pray? Yeah. But we're to pray and be busy at the same time. For when we're alone, we're tempted with things like avarice. That's greed. Envy. Anger. Worry. And impure thoughts. Third principle. Temptation is a desire for things and, uh, and to try to receive them independent of God's will. That's verses 3 through 10. We'll look at briefly the three temptations here. But within the three temptations, there is a common theme. Two of the three temptations begin with these words, if or since you are the Son of God, this guy who has authority to do anything. Uh, and it is also implied in the third temptation. The gist of what Satan is doing is this. Since you are the Son of God, don't you have the authority to provide for your needs and what you so desire? But Jesus submitted to the will of God. He didn't ever act independently of God. Though he was God, he was the Son of God. And he was the Son of Man. And therefore, he submitted to the Father. In fact, in eternity, he still has this role even though he is one with him. And so he very flatly said, no, I do not. Was there anything wrong, as we look at the first temptation, with food? He's hungry. Um, and 
There would be nothing wrong, uh, per se, with um, uh, eating some food. But it was not God's will for him at that time to be fed. He was being tested. The food and the care would come in verse 11, as the angels attended to him. God's will for him was to hunger, to suffer, and be tried. And we need to know that God's will for us may not be uh, to have all that we want, but to go without, to suffer, uh, knowing that reward comes in the end and maybe not later in this life, but in the end, in heaven. The second temptation has to do with national power and fame. Was there anything wrong with this? Well, Jesus was the king of the Jews, right? He was the king of Israel. And so Satan knows this, but hey, if you would just go up here, throw yourself off and let the angels save you, you'd become an overnight sensation. You could become the king in a matter of uh, uh, hours here. You know, just think about it. You go up there, you make the spectacle of yourself, you jump off, these angels save you, and goes, wow, you're our man, you're our hero. There was rabbis who had ideas like this. They said when Messiah King comes that he was going to go to the roof of the temple, and so people had this in mind, and if he would have just done it, he could have been a spectacle before everybody and received it instantly. But it was a shortcut, and that's what Satan wanted him to do. He didn't want him to wait. How was his authority going to come? Through the cross, through the cross. And so no crown before the cross. And so he was able to fight that temptation off to the third one has to do with the same uh, thing that is authority, but it's now universal authority. All he had to do was worship the wrong person. Jesus knew already that he had full authority. <laughs> he was the God of this universe. He wasn't going to be tempted by it, but that's the temptation there. And um, again, he knew that it would come through the death and resurrection, and then, of course, the crown. So no shortcuts. Instant gratification is the summary, if you will, of all three temptations. Is having things, a home, a car, some luxuries, wrong? No. They're all good things. In the right context, they are God's gifts to us. We're told that we must provide for our own in the material things of life. And if a man doesn't provide for his own, what does the scripture say? He's worse than an infidel. Okay? Perfectly good. But it may not be God's plan for us to have all we would like now. And we may never have all that we would like now. There's no equality in life. So we need to learn to become content. You know, some, it seems, are so after Money, you know, it just seems to, they're obsessed, they're possessed with this thing, and they'll do anything they possibly can to get it, but there's a price tag with that. There's a price tag, you know? Relationships are hurt, and so forth. There's, there, there are wrecks in lives because of it. So we've got to be really, really careful. And if God intends for us to have things in the future, then let's wait. Let's just wait. Is the desire for sex wrong? You nervous? Is the desire for sex wrong? Not at all. If it is, then there's a whole lot of sinning going on. No, it is a God-given thing. But the temptation is to have sex at the wrong time and in the wrong place. Is the desire to be married wrong? Certainly not. I've told you about this. You remember when I told you how I thought at one time Jesus was coming next week? You know? And I thought, all I would like to do, Lord, is be married before you come. Then you can come. Okay? Nothing wrong with that. The temptation, however, especially when you feel that time is running out, is to marry outside of God's will and to marry the wrong person. And we all must bear in mind that God may have some to stay single. God has used many single people. I think of John R. W. Stott, 
You know, that famous British preacher, he was a preacher to all souls for I don't know how many years, finally became a pastor to the whole world, wrote many, many books. He fully expected to be married. And he's realizing, well, wait a minute, I'm 40-something and it isn't happening now. And a couple of girls were presenting themselves, you know, at church, but he wasn't interested there. And he realized that God was going to keep him celibate, okay? But look what he was able to do because of it. And he says so right, right in his, uh, well, the guy who wrote the biography, but it was, you know, from John Stott. Is having authority a bad thing? Mm -mm. God created places of authority. The temptation, the, the, the temptation is to desire it more than we should. To become this ladder climber, you know. Just accept what God gives, but some have to climb the ladder. They're never satisfied. Fulfill some inner craving for it. And then there is the temptation, once people have uh, arrived, to use authority in the wrong way. Got to fight off selfishness. So the thing to do is to just go about life in the normal way, be content with God's will, don't get impatient, and hence do something foolish. We're not to fulfill our desires independently of God's will. Fourth principle, temptation is fought with the help of the Holy Spirit and God's word. When Jesus was baptized, the Holy Spirit came upon him. And though he was God, he was also man, so he would draw upon the Father to work through him. He would seek the help from heaven. It's a mystery, and we'll just leave it there. But Acts 2.22 makes it clear that Jesus did miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him. So Jesus' mission would be fulfilled with the anointing of God, the Holy Spirit. Being, or Jesus being God, relied upon God. And by the way, a, work, a word about ministry and mission. We need to rely upon the power of the Holy Spirit and not assume anything. Okay? All ministry, if it's going to be used of God, must be anointed by the Holy Spirit. Because, and that person or persons ought to be utterly dependent upon him as they do. The second means that Jesus used to fight the devil was the Word of God. And the devil actually twists Scripture here. He leaves out some of it, uses it for his own means. Maybe he can even use Scripture. He knows Scripture. He knew who Christ was and so forth. But he twists it. He perverted it so that um, he could maybe trip Jesus up. But Christ was smart enough to defend himself. You know, we can do that. We can you know, want something, and we can twist Scripture to get what we want. And we better be careful and smart enough, you know, knowledgeable enough to catch ourselves. The summary is this, is that there are two agents we need to draw upon for, God's, uh, for, for help. The Spirit and the Word of God. These two agents are always working together. It's the Holy Spirit, the Helper, who brings God's Word home to us. Do you know what I want? I want a pickup truck. <laughs> I... After I said this first service, he says, you know, some of these guys might want to get rid of their old used pickup trucks and they'll give them to you. I said, I don't want their old used pickup truck. I want a new one. <laughs> and there's a certain kind, okay? I've wanted one for a long, long time. Think about all the years I've hunted. You go out and hunt and you got your car there and you try to get that deer up on top of the car yourself and then tie it down, you know, and so forth, you know? And you can't throw kids in the back of the pickup truck and say, let's go on a vacation, so you buy a van. Our van now has 250,000 miles on it. Still running really well. Um, but I'm going to have to wait to get the truck. Two times I've tried to rationalize getting one sooner. Our daughter and son-in-law were having a second child. Well, they can't just ride around that little Honda. They're going to need a van. You know, we could drive our van down, give it to them, and um, uh, then we could fly back and I could buy a truck. <laughs> She's always telling me there's not enough money yet. <laughs> the second one was with our son, Connor. <laughs> he has my old Escort. And there's, a, there's an internal problem, and he can get through, you know, for a while, but... 
you know, it's going to soon be replaced. I said, well, how about taking our van? <laughs> and I'll, I'll go get a truck. But the time is not right. It just isn't right. It would be poor stewardship. Our money is God's money. We're given that money to manage and to manage it well. And so it is not the time to do so. But there's also something else that's been going on. Because I go on the websites and I look at this truck and stuff and I just go, ah, don't even think about it. It's the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit just saying, no, just wait. And when the time's right, you're going to know it. Fifth and final principle. Temptation's power has been conquered and can be. Isn't it interesting that the devil tried to make Jesus bend to his authority, even offered him, you know, uh, his authority and so forth, if he would just worship him. But Jesus all the time has authority over him. Be gone, Satan, and he leaves. Jesus would conquer, um, uh, Jesus would conquer the devil on the cross, and this is a preview of that same authority. But here's something else we need to think about, that because we are united with Christ, we too have found a conquering over the reign of sin and death and the devil. Our union with Christ allows us to experience uh, something similarly. Before we were saved, the devil was our master. Now Christ is our master. I'm not going to paint an idealistic picture of the victorious Christian life. We all have our weaknesses and sins. But let's not think that we don't have the ability to say no. We do. When tempted, we need to stop and think things through. If Christ has conquered sin and death and the devil, if in Christ I have been set free from the reign of sin and the devil, if I have the Holy Spirit, and if there is no temptation which has overtaken us, but as such is common to man, but as God is faithful, who will not allow us to be tempted beyond what we are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, that you may be able to endure it. If all of that's true, and it is, then we can say no. We can resist the devil like Jesus, and the devil will flee from us. You know, it's so easy at that moment to say, but wouldn't it be fun? Wouldn't it be fun to just give in? No. We'll be sorry if we do. And at that point, we pray. And then we get up and we get busy. The only way to a clear conscience is to resist temptation. The only way to experience our freedom in Christ is to resist the devil. What does James say in chapter 4? Submit, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the reminder how we need it, how fallible we are. You know that. And yet you've chosen us to be your children and represent you. So have your way. May we fare well and finish well. We pray in Christ. Amen.